the United States Steel Corporation, half a million employees and stockholders present the Theater Guild on the air. Theater Guild, one of America's foremost producers of stage plays, including Oklahoma, Carousel, and over 150 productions in the American theater, comes to you now over the air. Tonight we bring you Eugene O'Neill's great comedy romance, Our Wilderness, starring Walter Houston and featuring Jackie Kelp, and Eugene O'Neill Jr. as narrator. And here is Lawrence Langner, co-administrator with Teresa Helburn of the Theater Guild, to tell you about tonight's play. Mr. Langner. Ladies and gentlemen, our play tonight is Our Wilderness, Eugene O'Neill's comedy of American family life. This play provided the late George M. Cohan with his finest dramatic role and his longest run. A year in New York and two years on tour. O'Neill, America's only playwright to win the Nobel Prize, got the play title from Persia's bibulous bard, Omar Khayyam. In our wilderness, O'Neill is writing of the confusions of youth, its follies and its fevers, its heroics and heartbreaks. And he writes of it with great understanding and with great compassion, because he's setting down echoes of his own boyhood. O'Neill was born in a Broadway hotel and raised in New London, Connecticut. He is the son of the celebrated actor James O'Neill, who tinkled the spines of our parents with his gusty performance as the Count of Monte Cristo. O'Neill told me the story of how Our Wilderness came to be written. He'd been working over a year on another play. He was tired and felt a week's rest would refresh him. His rest lasted a single night. He awoke happy and excited in the grip of Our Wilderness, the plot, characters, and story vivid in his mind. The words poured out in torrents. He wrote the entire play in three weeks. Tonight will not be the first time Walter Houston has played an O'Neill father. As the father in Desire Under the Elms, Mr. Houston first won stardom. Since this play is about a father and son, it seems especially fitting to have as narrator the author's son, Eugene O'Neill, Jr. And now our play, Eugene O'Neill's Our Wilderness. we turn back the pages of time for a nostalgic hour. It is the year 1906 in the United States of America. Teddy Roosevelt is in the White House. There's a blacksmith on every Main Street, and the automobile is a luxury item. The women are wearing merry widow hats, chatelaine bags, and black lisle stockings with lace openwork. And the men? Ah, the men have discovered peg-top trousers. Those strange indispensables you can climb into only by removing your shoes. There is a pug dog and a zither in every home. And the title on the sheet music on every piano is Betty Ilya. And now that we've established the color and the period, I'd like you to meet the Miller family. They live in a large, small town in Connecticut where Nat Miller is the owner and publisher of the local newspaper. First, there's Tommy, the youngest. Oh, I don't want any more milk, Ma. And I said, excuse me, and you said, all right. Can I go out and play now, Ma? May I go out? May I? Yes, but you set off your crackers away from the house, remember? Yes, ma'am. This is Mildred and Arthur, two more of the Miller children. Children? Oh, uh, I beg your pardon, Mildred. Uh, of course, you're not a child anymore. Uh, how old are you? Fifteen. And four months. Well, uh, of course. Uh, now, suppose you describe yourself. 
Well, I'm tall and rather slender. I've got a nice nose and gray eyes. Well, I think I'm attractive. Uh, what are you wearing? I've got on high black shoes with French heels, a long black pleated skirt, very full at the bottom, and a white shirt waist. My hair is up, of course. Thank you. Uh, what about you, Arthur? I am a sophomore at Yale. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Uh, and here, unless I'm mistaken, are Mrs. Miller and Aunt Lily. Goodness, Tommy left the screen door open. The house will be alive with flies. Well, you can't expect a boy to remember to shut doors on the 4th of July. That's you all over, Lily. You'll have that boy spoiled to death in spite of me. Oh, I'm hot, aren't you? Oh, this is going to be a scorcher. Arthur, get up and let your Aunt Lily sit down. Take your mandolin over to the window seat. Certainly. Aunt Lily, my chair. Thank you, dear. And here come the gentlemen, Mr. Nathaniel Miller himself and Uncle Sid Davis. Nat has just turned 50. He's a little stoop-shouldered now from reading copy, and his hair, well, let's call it thin. What's the name of that piece, Arthur? Waltz Me Around Again, Willie. Oh, sure, I know that one. Oh, waltz me around again, Willie. Sid is Mrs. Around, Miller's brother, around, but he is not around, married to Aunt Lily. There's been talk about it for 20 years now, but Aunt Lily won't have him because, well, you'll hear about that later. Well, I guess that's about everybody except Richard. Arthur, where is Richard? He's still in the dining room reading a book. My gosh, he's always reading now. What's that into him, anyhow? He reads his school books, too, things that may seem to you. That's why he came out the top of his class. I'm hoping before you leave New Haven, they'll find time to teach you reading is a good habit. Sure, but not the way he does it. I believe in moderation. All right, that'll be enough out of you. Sid, you're coming to the Onondaga Club picnic with me this afternoon? You bet. Sid, you be careful, won't you? Oh, sure. We're going to have dinner in the evening tonight, you know. The best chore dinner you ever tasted. And I don't want you coming home, well, not able to appreciate Oh, you'll be careful today, won't you, Sid? Lily, I swear to you, if any man offers me a drink, I'll kill him. <laughs> That is, if he changes his mind. <laughs> uh, want to come with me to the fireworks display at the beach tonight, Lily? Oh, I, I'd like to see it, thank you. Only not if you come home. Nat, you know. Nat, your sister's got an evil mind. She reads evil into everything I do, even before I do it. That reminds me, Nat, you've got to speak to Richard. It's about those evil books he's reading. I found some more in his closet. You've got to give him a good talking to. Do I have to on the 4th of July? That's got nothing to do with it. When it comes to a heart-to-heart -heart talk between a father and his son, the time of the year is irrelevant. You've got to talk to him right now. What's he reading? Nick Carter or old Cap Collier? No, he passed that period long ago. Poetry is his red meat nowadays. Love poetry. Hm. Socialism, too, I suspect. Well, might as well get him on the carpet. Richard? Richard! Richard! Hey, Dick, wake up. Pa's calling you. All right, I'm coming you want me, Pa? I hoped I'd made that plain. I didn't hear you, Pa. I was off in another world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you hear that, everybody? He was off in another world. What were you planning to do today, Richard? Going to the beach with your sister? That silly skirt party? I should say not. He's not coming because Muriel McCumber isn't. I bet he's got a date with her somewhere. You shut up. I thought I'd just stay home, Pa. This morning, anyway. Help uh, Tommy set off firecrackers, eh? Father, I am 17 years old. A man of 17 does not spend his time with firecrackers. Besides, I don't believe in this silly celebrating the 4th of July. All this lying talk about liberty when there is no liberty. Mm. The land of the free and the home of the brave. Home of the slave is what they ought to call it. The wage slave. Ground under the heel of his master. Starving, crying out for bread for his children. And all he gets is a stone. I tell you, the 4th of July is a stupid farce. My Hmm, them are mighty strong words, son. You better not repeat such sentiments outside the bosom of your family or they'll have you in jail. Yep, and throw away the key. Let them put me in jail. No, you can celebrate your 4th of July. I'll celebrate the day the people bring out the guillotine. That's what this country needs, plenty of guillotines. The days grow hot, O oh Babylon. Tis cool beneath thy willow There tree. you are, Pa. That must be from one of those awful books he's reading. Yeah, what uh, books are they, son? I'll tell you. There was one by that Oscar Wilde, The Picture the of... The Picture of... of Dorian Gray. One of the greatest novels ever written in the English language. 
Then there was a play by that Irishman, Barnard Shaw. The greatest living playwright in the English language. And poems by a man named Swin... Poems Swin... and ballads by Algernon Charles Swinburne. Just the greatest living poet in the English language. He... He tells the truth about real love. Love? Why... Why, some of the things I simply couldn't read, they're so, so indecent. All about... Well, I can't tell you before Lily and Mildred. And he just got a new one yesterday. The ruby... Oh, what is it, Richard? The ruby out of Omar Khayyam. Well, that's the best of all. No, oh, I've read that, Mother. I got a copy at the office. I, I read that, too, at the library. I like some parts of it. The moving finger writes, and having writ, moves on. Nor all your piety nor wit shall lure it back to cancel half a line. Nor all your tears wash out a word of it. What? Why, Lily, I never knew you to recite poetry before. Good for you, Aunt Lily. Oh, but that isn't the best. The best is a book of verses underneath the bough, a jug of wine, a loaf of bread, and thou beside me, singing in the wilderness. Now, who in the world old can... Oh, man, I... Macomber, I can see him through the window. Dave? What in thunder that old boring idiot? Excuse me, I was just leaving. Yeah, me too. I got to catch a nine o'clock trial. Wait for me, or wait like I'm a hat. And that you'll get rid of him the first second you can. Well, I want to. Why talk do to I you have about... to listen to that old buzzard? Why is it He's always He's your biggest I... advertiser, dear. That's why. Don't you think I know that? If it weren't, you know what I'd do? I'd take him by the seat of the pants and I'd. All right, everybody, clear out. If that old battleaxe has got something to complain about, he's come to the right party this time. I'm just about fed up with his. And you come back here as soon as he leaves, Richard. I'm not through with you yet. Oh, come in, Mr. McComber. Sit down. Have a cigar. You're forgetting. I never smoke. Oh, so I was, yeah. Well, I'll smoke alone, then. I'll come to the point at once. I regret to say it's something disagreeable. Disgraceful would be near the truth. And it concerns your son, Richard. Oh, come, Dave. I'm sure Richard hasn't... Uh... I positive he has. You're not calling me a liar, I hope. No one said anything about a liar. I only meant you're surely mistaken if you think that... I'm not mistaken. I have proof of everything in his own handwriting. Well, let's get down to brass tacks. Now, just what it is you're charging my son with. With being dissolute and blasphemous. I charge him with deliberately attempting to corrupt the morals of my daughter, Muriel. Then I'm afraid I will have to call you a liar, Dave. I thought you'd get around to that, so I brought some of the proofs with me. Have a look at them. I have a lot more at home. What are they, letters? You might call them that. Can you deny they're in your son's handwriting? No, I can't. Anyways, Muriel's confessed he wrote them to her. Go on, read one, out loud. My life is bitter with thy love. Thine eyes blind me. Thy tresses burn me. Thy sharp sighs divide my flesh and spirit with soft sound. Why, that's swindling. Exactly. And that's one of the mild ones. Evidently, you've been too busy to take the right care about Richard's bringing up or what he's allowed to read. But that's your misfortune and none of my business. But my daughter Muriel is my business, and I can't, and I won't have her innocence exposed to the contamination of a young man whose mind, judging from his choice of reading matter, is as foul oh, as... Oh, you darned old fool. Can't you see Richard's only a fool kid who's just at the stage when he's out to rebel against all authority, so he, he grabs at anything radical to read, and he wants to pass it on to his girl and boyfriend. Yes, and he's elders, too. To show off what a young hellion he is. Here, take this stuff back. It doesn't mean anything to me. That is nothing of what you think it means. And if you believe that this would corrupt Muriel, <laughs> then you must believe she's easily corrupted. Now you're insulting my daughter. I won't forget that. I'm not insulting her. I think Muriel is a darn nice girl. That's why I'm giving her credit for ordinary good sense. Well, I knew you'd prove obstinate, but I certainly never dreamed you'd have the impudence what to stand What did you there. dream I'd do? Give him a hiding he'd remember to the last day of his life. He ought to do it for his sake if he had any sense, unless you want him to end up in jail. Dave, I've said all I can from you. Now you get out and get out quick before I'm I... I'm going, but there's one thing more. Here's a letter from Muriel for your son. Makes plain how she feels about him. I hope he heeds what's inside for his own good and yours, because if I ever catch him hanging around my place again, I'll have him arrested. And don't think I'm not going to make you regret your insults. I'm taking the advertisement for my store out of your paper. Go oh, ahead. I'll call your bluff. And starting tomorrow, I'm going to refuse to print your ad. Why, when I get through, there won't be a person in town that'll buy a dish rag in your place. Now, get out. Hey, you forgot your letters. Hmm. Looks like they're all Swinburne. Hmm. 
and I could drink thy veins as wine and eat thy flesh like honey, that from face to feet thy body were abolished and consumed, and in my flesh thy very flesh entombed. Hmm. This stuff is kind of warm. <laughs> Too darn warm, if you ask me. Certainly not the kind of thing to be sending to a decent girl. Hmm. I thought the boy was just stuck on her. The way one gets stuck on a decent girl at his age. I wonder... I wonder if maybe... By the Lord, if that's true, I'll give him a hiding he'll never forget. Richard! Come in here! Yes, Pa? Now, look here, son. I'm going to ask you a question, and I want an honest answer. And I warn you beforehand, if the answer is yes, I'm going to punish you and punish you hard. Because you'll have done something no boy of mine ought to do. But you've never lied to me before, I know, and I don't believe even to save yourself punishment, you'd lie to me now. Would you? I won't lie, Pa. Have you been trying to have something to do with Muriel? Something... You know what I mean. No. What do you think I am, Pa? Why, I, I love her. I'm going to marry her after I get out of college. She said she would. We're engaged. All right. That's all I wanted to know. I don't see how you could think... Did that old idiot Macomba say that about mm, me? You shouldn't be calling your future father-in-law names. It ain't respectable. It's these letters you wrote. What letters? Oh, Swinburne. They're beautiful, aren't they? Mm, a little strong, I'd say. Uh, by the way, uh, here's one from her to you. Uh, better be prepared for a bit of a blow, son. Well, I'll see you at dinner. Mr. Richard Miller, this is to let you know that I have no wish to see you ever again, anywhere, anytime. Please do not make a nuisance of yourself by trying to get me to change my mind as my eyes have been opened to your true character. Very truly yours, Muriel Macomber. That little coward. I hate her. She can't treat me like that. I'll show her. I'll show her. Muriel. Muriel. Nat and Sid aren't going to be late for dinner. But I suppose with that darn picnic, it's more likely than not. I see you've got your new dress on, Lily. Yes, I thought if Sid's taking me to the fireworks tonight, I, I ought to spruce up a little. Lily, why don't you change your mind and marry Sid and reform him? You love him and always have. I can't love a man who drinks. Essie, it's 16 years since I broke off our engagement. 16 years? Mm -hmm. But if he keeps his promise and stays sober and takes me to the fireworks tonight, then... Oh, he must. It, it's our last chance. I know it. Well, dear, I hope you're right. Good gracious, if I'm not forgetting, I've got to warn that Tommy against giving me away to Nat about the fish. What? He knows because I had to send him to market for it. And... Oh, Essie, what are you talking about? Well, you know how Nat carries on about not being able to eat bluefish. Yes, I know. He says there's a certain oil in it that poisons him. Poisons him nothing. He's been eating bluefish for years. Oh. Only I tell him each time it's weak fish. Oh. We're having it tonight. And... <laughs> oh, Ma. Aunt Lily. Oh, it's you, Richard. Feel any better, dear? It doesn't matter. Nothing matters. Dick, you really mustn't let it upset you this way. Things like this come up all the time, I know. Things like what, Aunt Lily? You and Muriel. Oh, her. I wasn't even thinking about her. I was thinking about life. And, Lily, life is a joke. Oh. Everything comes out all wrong in the end. Richard, I think you must be hungry. I'm not hungry a bit. Food, that's all you think of in this house. Well, somebody's got to think of it. And that reminds me, it's time to put the weak fish in. <laughs> Coming, Lily? <laughs> yes, Essie. Yes, yes. Fine thing. The world torn up. Civilization in its death rattle. And all they think of is food. Hey, hey, Dick. Open the screen door and let me in. 
10 anyway. Oh, darn. I, I thought he'd be here for dinner. Gosh, that gums the works for fair. Well, what is it, Wynn? Can I help? Well, I might tell you if you can keep your face shut. Oh, I can. Well, I ran into a couple of swift babies from New Haven this afternoon. I dated them up in a night thinking I could catch art. But now it, it's too late to get anyone else and I'm nearly broke and I can't afford to blow them both to drinks. Well, I've got $11 saved up. I could loan you some. Nick's kid. Now, I don't want to borrow your money, but you're a good sport. Say, say, ha have you got anything on for tonight? No. Well, you want to come along with me? I'm, I'm not trying to lead you astray, understand, but it would be a help if you just sit around with Belle while I'm with Edith. See what I mean? You don't have to do anything, not even take a glass of beer unless you want to. Oh, what do you think I am? A rube? You mean you're game for anything that's doing? Sure I am. You ever been out with any girls? I mean, real swift ones? Oh, what do you think? Sure I have. Say, don't worry about me. Okay. I, I wouldn't ask you if I didn't know you were coming down to Yale next year. I don't want to lead you astray. Oh, I've been around. Well, you'll be at the Pleasant Beach house at half past eight then. The back room. And bring some clothes to take the booze off your breath. So long. So long, Wind. See you right after dinner tonight. <laughs> You not only come home late to dinner, but in a state of... What? of... A, a, a good fellowship. That's the word for it. And after you promise Lily. Oh, never mind me, Essie. My feelings are of no consequence. Ma, can I have some more lobster? Certainly, dear. Uh, Richard? Huh? Oh, no thanks, Ma. But you've hardly eaten a thing. And that little you've bolted as though you were in an awful sweat to get someplace. Me? In a sweat to... Oh, where would I be going? Well, maybe I'm imagining things. Nat, how about you? No thanks, sir. Uh... I'll have some of that other, uh, uh, it isn't bluefish by any chance, is it, my dear? Well, of course not. You know we never have bluefish on account of you. No, I regret to say there's a certain peculiar oil in bluefish that invariably poisons. <laughs> Stop that, Tom. Stop that this instant. I, I can't help it, Ma. Well, I don't see what's so darn funny about my being poisoned. Ha-ha, Nat, I suspect the plot. This fish looks blue to me, very blue. Ah, 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 look at your wife. Regards that guilty expression? Can it be this woman has been slowly and systematically poisoning you all these years? Can it? Oh, give us a rest, you darn fool. A joke's a joke, but is this true, Essie? Yes, dear, it is true, if you must know. You've eaten bluefish for years and thrived on it, and it's all nonsense about that peculiar oil. Essie, kindly allow me to know my own constitution. Now I think of it, I have felt so upset afterwards every darn time I've had fish. Yeah, you take it away. I, I can't eat this. Well, don't then. Have some lobster. In the sweet... How about you, Sid? Bye. No, thanks. We will meet on oh, that mercy beautiful sake, Sid, can't you stop singing? No, ma'am. When I feel good, I want the world to know. Work and friends. One. Look it, look it. Uncle Sid's hid in the floor, shells and all. Sid, do you want to kill yourself? Take it away from him, Lily. I'm not responsible for your brother's actions, Essie. That's right. She's not responsible. Wouldn't take the responsibility as a gift. Lily doesn't like responsibility. Sid, I think you'd better go up to bed for a while. Bed? Uh, bed. Uh. Yes, maybe you're right. But first, there is still a duty I must perform. No day is complete without it. Lily, I regret I am too drunk to take you to the fireworks this evening. I regret it very, very much. And now I ask you, Lily, once and for all, will you marry me? No, Sid, I won't. Right. Don't blame me at all. In the sweet by and by... <laughs> well, that's it. He's a case. <laughs> Darn if you can help laughing at him, even when he's... <laughs> Just it. Everyone always laughing. Everyone always saying what a card he is, what a case, what a caution. So funny. He's 
go on. Now, now, we're Lily. all responsible, making it easy for him. We're all to blame. And all we do is laugh. Now, Lily, now, you mustn't take on. So it isn't as serious as all that. Maybe it is to me or was once. Oh, I'm sorry, Ned. I'm sorry, Essie. I, I'm not feeling myself tonight. If you'll excuse me, I'll, I'll just go into the parlor and lie down on the sofa for a while. Poor Lily. Why, Richard, you haven't had your ice cream yet. Where are you going? Oh, I don't want any ice cream, Ma. Your mother asked you where you were going. Oh, well, for a walk, I guess. I'll see you later. Good night. Uh, don't come home late, dear, and be careful. What with all those fireworks going off don't and worry everything. Don't worry about me, Ma. Nothing can happen to me. <laughs> You are listening to the Theater Guild on the Air, presented by the United States Steel Corporation. Tonight's play is Eugene O'Neill's Our Wilderness, starring Walter Houston and featuring Jackie Kelp and Eugene O'Neill, Jr. as narrator. Now, before our second act begins, here, speaking for United States Steel, is the well-known reporter of the American Broadcasting Company, George Hicks. Good evening. During the past week, I learned several important facts about how U.S. Steel works to produce better steels so that you will get better values in the products of steel you buy. For example, I learned a few things about U.S. Steel's tremendous and continuous research program, which I think will interest you. In the first place, each company in the U.S. Steel family has its own research organization. But in addition, much of the important work done by these individual research organizations is coordinated with the work of U.S. Steel's General Research Laboratory in Kearney, New Jersey. In other words, improvements in steel making are the result of pooled resourcefulness, and this system of combined research activity will go on saving millions of dollars for you, the public, in peace, just as it did for you during the war. Incidentally, I think you'll be interested to learn that at the big Kearney Laboratory, internships, very much like those served by doctors, are provided for men selected from U.S. Steel District and Plant Laboratories all over the country. These men stay a year or more in Kearney, working on specific problems and observing research techniques, and then return to the U.S. Steel subsidiary companies to continue their own activities. Yes, the research activities of U.S. Steel may be centered in Kearney, where scientists and engineers work on so many fundamental problems, but they also extend to almost every plant and mine of the corporate family, and countless investigations are continuously in progress. However, these investigations are not confined to metallurgical research, but include studies of all the materials that go into the manufacture of steel. And every hour consumed and every dollar spent in all this research has but one purpose, and that is to produce better steel, more uniform steel at the lowest possible cost. Today, the scientists and metallurgists of U.S. Steel have left the problems of wartime and are now concentrating on the improvement of steel for peacetime products and processes. The result of this carefully integrated program of research, both in the Kearney and the U.S. Steel plant laboratories all over America, will be reflected in the automobiles you drive, the tin cans on your grocer's shelves, the bolts and screws you tighten, your garden tools, and in the thousands of other products vital to modern civilization. We now pause for station identification. WJZ, New York. We continue with the second act of Eugene O'Neill's Our Wilderness, starring Walter Houston and featuring Jackie Kelp and Eugene O'Neill, Jr. as narrator. back in 1906, and it's still the 4th of July. It's evening now. Dad and Mother and Aunt Lily are in the parlor. Uncle Sid has gone upstairs to sleep off his uh, high spirits. And Dick, well, young Richard, having just been thrown over by his best girl, has set his feet firmly along the path to ruin. To help out a friend, he has consented to be the fourth party in a blind date. 
with two swift babies from New Haven. We see him now at the Pleasant Beach House, a notorious waterfront dive. And with him is, yes, one of the swift babies. Her name is Belle. So this is the Pleasant Beach House. Gee. This is it. And my name is Belle, remember? Of course I do. I... I wonder where my friend Wint disappeared to. Stop worrying. He'll be back. So will Edith. Drink up your beer, why don't you? It's getting flat. Oh, I let it get that way on purpose. I like it when it's flat. Then how about loosening up and, and buying me another drink, huh? Oh, certainly. Excuse me, I, I was thinking of something else. Have anything you like. A bartender, see what the lady will have. And have one on me yourself. Ah, hey, you're a sport, all right. I'll have a cigar. What do you have, candy kid? The same? Uh-huh. What's yours, mister? Another beer? Uh, a small one, please. I'm not thirsty. Say, kid, I don't know what to make of you. You got me guessing. Don't you know filling up on beer will only make you sleepy? Have a man's drink. Oh, all right. I was going to. A uh, bartender, bring me a slow gin fizz. And make it a real one. Come on up. Say, dearie, uh, are you sore at me? Me? No, of course not. Whatever gave you that idea? You see, it's, it's this way with me. I think you're one of the sweetest kids I've ever met. And I could like you such a lot if, if you'd give me a chance. Instead of acting so cold and indifferent. Oh, I'm not cold and indifferent. It's only that I've got a weight on my mind. Well, get it off. You'll feel better. Here you are. That'll be 40 cents with the cigar. Oh, here's a dollar. Uh, keep the change. Thank you, sir. Don't mention it. Well, here's how. Bottoms up. <laughs> That's the stuff. Gee, you got pretty hair. Honey boy, I'm, I'm crazy about you. And you pretend to be in love. If I told Muriel that... Oh, is it from her? Uh-huh. A letter. I was walking past her house just now, and she threw it down to me. Here it is. Oh, gee, it must be nice to be in love like you are. All with one person. Oh, gee, do you know what she says? She didn't mean a word in that other letter. Her old man made her write it. And she loves me and only me and always will, no matter how they punish her. My, I never thought she had that much spunk. And she's going to try to sneak out and meet me tonight. I don't know whether I'll consent to keep this date or not. Well, I know. You're not allowed out, so you can't keep it. I'm going to sneak out right now. You tell Pa and Ma after I've gone so they won't worry, like last night. All right. But what do you do till nighttime? It's ages to wait. Oh, what do I care how long I wait? I'll think of her and dream. I'd wait a million years and never mind it for her. Trouble with you is you don't know what love means. What happened, Dick, from the beginning? Well, Muriel, after I read your first letter, I didn't want to live anymore. Life seemed like a tragic farce. I'm so awfully sorry, Dick. Honest, I am. You might have known I'd never write that I I thought your love for me was dead. I thought you'd never love me. But you'd only been cruelly mocking me to torture me. Oh, Dick, I'd never. You know I'd never. I wanted to die. I sat and brooded about death. Finally, I made up my mind to kill myself. Oh, Dick, you did I did, too. I thought, when I am dead, she will be sorry she ruined life. If you ever had, I'd have died, too. Honest, I would. Suicide is the act of a coward. That's what stopped me. And anyway, I thought to myself, she isn't worth it. Well, that's a nice thing to say. Well, if you meant what was in the letter, you wouldn't have been worth it, would you? But I've told you a dozen times, Pa me. So you. I said to myself, I am through with women. They are all alike. I'm not. And I thought, what difference does it make what I do now? I might as well forget her and lead the pace that kills and drown my sorrows. You know, I had $11 saved up to buy you something for your birthday. But I thought, she's dead to me now. Why shouldn't I throw it away? Oh, I've still got almost five left, Muriel. I can get you something nice with that. What do I care about your old present? Tell me what happened. Well, after it was dark, I sneaked out and went to a low dive I know about. 
a secret house of shame. They let me into a secret room behind the bar room. There wasn't anyone there but a Princeton senior I know. He belongs to Tiger Inn and he's fullback on the football team. And he had two chorus girls from New York with him. And they were all drinking champagne. Oh, Dick Miller, I hope you did I had a highball myself. Then I noticed one of the girls, uh, the one that wasn't with the fullback, looking at me. She had strange-looking eyes. Then she asked me if I wouldn't drink champagne with them and come and sit with her. She must have been a nice thing. Did you? Oh, why shouldn't I? When you told me in that letter you'd never see me again. But you ought to have known about me. I didn't know that then. She had yellow hair. The kind that burns and stings you. Did you get drunk? Only a little at first. But you ought to have seen me when I got home. I was on the verge of delirium treatments. Did you kiss her? No, I didn't. You did, too. You're lying and you know it. You did, too. I hate you. I wish you were dead. I'm going home this minute. I never want to lay eyes on you again. And this time I mean it. Muriel, wait, listen. I don't want to listen. Let me go. If you don't, I'll bite your hand. I won't let you go. You've got to let me explain. I Ouch. All right. Go if you want to. If you haven't the decency to let me explain, I'll go back to her of the yellow tresses that burn and sting. See, that's what I mean. Was she... Very beautiful? Yes. But not as beautiful as you. Do you love her? No. I love you. I'm sorry I hurt your hand. It was nothing. Muriel. Yes? Can I... Can I kiss you? Will it wash off her kisses? Make you forget for always? Oh, Yes. All right, then, Dick. The moon is beautiful tonight, isn't it? Not as beautiful as you. Nothing is. Wouldn't it be wonderful after we're married? Gosh, but I love you. Gosh, I love you, darling. I love you, too, sweetheart. Where are we going, our honeymoon, Dick? Niagara Falls. That dump where all the silly fools go. I should say not. No, we'll go to some wonderful place. Somewhere out on the long trail. The trail that is always new. On the road to Mandalay. We'll watch the dawn come up like thunder out of China. Oh, that'll be wonderful, won't it? <laughs> I'm glad Mildred told me where Richard went off to. I would have worried my heart out if she hadn't. But now it's all right. Well, I wouldn't go as far as to say that. Just because we know he's all right tonight doesn't mean that last night is wiped out. He's still got to be punished for that. Nat, I told you how sorry he was and how he said he'd never touch liquor again. It didn't make him feel happy like Sid, but only sad and sick. So he didn't see anything in it for him. That's what he said. Well, if he's really got that view of it driven into his skull, I don't know but when I'm glad it all happened. That'll protect him more than a thousand lectures. Just horse sense about himself. Still, I, I can't let him do such things and go scot-free. And then besides, there, there's another side to it. What do you mean, another side? I mean, uh, uh, discipline. There's got to be some discipline in the family. I don't want him to get the idea. He's got a stuffed shirt at the head of the table. That's Richard now. Hello. Hello, Richard. Hello, son. Goodness, he acts queer. Nat, do you suppose he's been... No, no, it's love, not liquor this time. Richard, what's the matter with you? Why are you sitting down over there in the dark? Huh? Your father's been waiting to talk to you. Uh, you better leave Richard and me alone for a while, uh, Mother. Well, uh, all right. I'll go sit on the piazza. Call me if you want me. Sit down over here, Richard. Well, how are the vine leaves in your hair this evening? I don't know, Pa. Turned out to be poison ivy, didn't they? I know I was a darn fool. <laughs> you sure were. 
Not only a fool, but a downright stupid, disgusting fool. It was bad enough for you to let me and Arthur see you, but to appear like that before your mother and Mildred. And I wonder if Muriel would think you were so fine if she ever saw you as you looked and acted then. I think she'd give you your walking papers for keeps. You couldn't blame her. No nice girl wants to give her love to a stupid drunk. I know, Pa. All right. And that settles that. The booze end of it. But there's another thing that's more serious. How about that woman you were with at the Pleasant Beach house? Well, you know? Did you, uh... Uh, that is, uh... Did you? No, Pa, I didn't. Well, how, how'd you happen to meet this lady anyway? I can't tell that, Pa. I'd have to snitch on someone. You wouldn't want me to do that. No, I, I suppose I wouldn't. <clears throat> well, I believe you, and I guess that settles that. But listen here, Richard. It's about time, and you, I, you and I had a serious talk about uh, uh, certain matters pertaining to... Uh, and uh, now that the subject has come up of its own accord, it's, it's a good time... Well, I, I mean, there's no use in procrastinating further. So here goes. Richard, you have now come to the age when, well, you're a fully developed man, in a way, and it's, uh, and it's only natural for you, uh, I mean, uh, pertaining to the opposite sex, uh, uh, it's only natural for you... Uh, uh, here's what I'm driving at, Richard. <laughs> there are girls and uh, girls. I mean, your whole life may be ruined if... Uh, I mean, there are some who... Uh, I mean, there are apt to be whited sepulchers. And your whole future life may... Uh, I mean... Uh, uh, see what I mean? <laughs> Oh, heck, I suppose you boys talk all this over among yourselves, and you know more about it than I do. I'll admit I'm no authority. I never had anything to do with such women. It'll be a heck of a lot better for you if you never do. I'm never going to, Pa. I don't see how you could think I could now. When you know I love Muriel and I'm going to marry her. Why, well, I'd die before That's I... the talk. By George, I'm proud of you when you talk like that, son. <laughs> There's nothing more I can say when we'll, we'll forget it, eh? How are you going to punish me, Pa? Oh, yeah, I was forgetting about that, wasn't I? Well, I... I thought of telling you that you couldn't go to Yale. Don't I have to? Gee, that's great. Muriel thought you'd want me to. I was telling her I'd rather you gave me a job on the paper because then she and I could get married sooner. Gee, Pa, you picked a lemon. That isn't my punishment. You'll have to do something besides that. Then you'll have to go to Yale and stay there until you graduate. And that's the answer to that. Muriel's got good sense, and you haven't. All right, Pa. You say so. I do say so. Now we're finished, you better call your mother. Ma. My, it's a beautiful night. The moon's way down low, almost setting. Yeah, I was noticing it, too. Don't believe I've ever seen such a beautiful night with such a wonderful moon. Have you, Richard? Oh, no. It was wonderful down at the beach... I can only remember a few nights that were as beautiful as this. They were so long ago when your mother and I were young and planning to get married. Yes. I'll bet those must have been wonderful nights, too. You sort of forget the moon was the same way back then and everything. You're all right, Richard. You're a good boy, Richard. Better get to bed tonight early now. Hadn't you some? Oh, I couldn't sleep. Can't I go on the piazza and sit for a while till the moon sets? All right. And you better say good night now. I, I don't know about your mother, but I'm going to bed right away. I'm dead tired. So am I. Kiss me good night, dear. Good night, Ma. Good night. Don't stay up till all hours now. Good night, Pa. Why, Dick? Hmm. First time he's done that in years. 
I don't believe in kissing between fathers and sons after a certain age. It seems mushy and silly, but that meant something. And, Mother, I I don't think we'll ever have to worry about his being safe from himself again. Um, I guess no matter what life will do to him, he, he can take care of it now. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Lawrence Langner again for the Theatre Guild to say thank you, Walter Houston, Jackie Kelk, Eugene O'Neill, Jr., and the rest of the cast of Our Wilderness. And now, a word or two about next week's play. It's the gay comedy Mr. Pym Passes By by A.A. A. Milne, author of many a whimsical and witty play, author, too, of at least one crack detective story, The Red House Mystery, and known the world over for his delightful children's books, including Winnie the Pooh. Shortly after its London production, a copy of Mr. Pym Passes By reached us. Within 24 hours, it had been read by Teresa Helbin and Maurice Wertheim, and forthwith these two pledged Mr. Milne a New York production by cable. The decision was as happy as it was rapid. Next Sunday night, you'll hear Mr. Pym Passes By with the attractive and witty Arlene Francis and Victor Jore as her husband. You've all heard Arlene Francis in Blind Date. Well, next Sunday, she has a blind date with the Theatre Guild on the air. The United States Steel Corporation hopes that you will be with us next week at the same time when we'll bring you A.A. A. Milne's immortal comedy, Mr. Pym Passes By. The staff for the Theatre Guild on the air includes Homer Fickett, director, George Condolf, producer, Armina Marshall, executive director of the radio department. The score was composed and conducted by Harold Levy, and tonight's play was adapted for radio by Arthur Aaron. Your announcer, Norman Brokenshire. Do you like to save theater programs, recall plays and players, settle arguments about which actor played which part? Then perhaps you'd like the program of the Theater Guild on the air, prepared for each broadcast with complete information about the play and the players. United States Steel is ready to send tonight's program to you upon request. Just address U.S. Steel, Radio Corporation, Radio Department, rather, 71 Broadway, New York City. This is the American Broadcasting Company.